Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. By the way, how many of you guys, just for curiosity, how many of you guys still have the old school type paper version Bible? Lift up your Bible. Let me see how many paper Bibles. One, two. Okay, only two. We are really a millennial church, right? We are Gen Z. Gen Z? Gen Z church. But let, let me say something. There, there are is still some benefits on reading your Bible in a paper version. And today I'm going to show you one of those benefits. Because the tendency when you're reading our Bibles in our digital tablets or devices is that we, we, we tend to separate the Bible in blocks or verses that are not necessarily there. And this is one of the cases that while you have your paper version, you can actually see the unity of the thought. And that's my attempt this morning. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. On three, everybody reads with me. One, two, three. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Once again, one, two, three. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Believing Holy Spirit, you are in this place. You are moving and you are with the intention. You have a plan when you invited and stirred the desire in the hearts of these brothers and sisters. Each one of them, especially the couples today, the families today. Because you want to bring revelation. Let the eyes of our hearts be open. And let us see the light of the gospel in our personal lives be transformed. In our relationships affected by this transformation. I pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 So, we have learned so much here in Ephesians chapter 5 about being spirit-filled. And during the week, I was meditating still on this passage in Ephesians chapter 5. The admonition of Paul is that we live a spirit-filled life. And I really like the fact that the word spirit in the original is the same word for breath or air movement. I like to say that when a person is spirit filled, that person will not become heavy loaded, complicated, annoying person. On the contrary, that person that is spirit filled is an easy going, pleasing person to be around. It's just like light weighted. It's fun to be around a person that is spirit-filled. Say amen, everybody. So don't come with saying, I am spirit-filled, so thus says the Lord, the church is judged. You are seen, you, you are in sin and start to condemn the church because the Holy Spirit is the comforter for the church. He is the breath of life, not the pointing finger of judgment. Don't come with the label of his spirit feel and start to damn on people and, and really bring people down. Spirit-filled people are light-weighted. They are filled with air. Everybody take a deep breath. You're already being filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Seriously, that's what the Bible says. But also, I can't just move forward uh, to not, re not reminding you also the comparison of being wine filled. So Paul compares here that a person that is spirit filled, he is inebriated, he is drunk, he has that state of joy that not necessarily has a reasonable cause for. You're just happy, you're just easy smiley, you just get easily fun off circumstances because you are not running from reality look the philosopher uh, behind the socialism movement Karl Marx once said 
that religion is the opium of the people, is the drug of the masses. He was wrong because opioids are still the opium of the masses. I made a brief research. Um, FBI said that in the 1960s, more than 80% of opioid abusers got hooked on heroin first. But in the 2000s, 75 of opioid abusers started with prescriptions opioids. In other words, we simply changed the buying place. We used to buy drugs on the corners of the streets in the dark. But now you can find in a standard pill container. People are still taking drugs to run from reality. They still getting drunk to run from the harsh reality. And let's be honest. I can understand why the people in the world wants to fantasize. Because life is hard for everybody. But for those that doesn't have the hope in Jesus Christ, it's even harder. To not say even impossible. So I really understand why people want to get drunk, get high, and turn off, and go to this uh, fake reality. However, does we, do, do we do the same when we want to be spirit-filled? When I invite you to be drunk in the spirit, am I calling you to run from reality? As Karl Marx once said, absolutely not. When we are spirit-filled, we are actually running toward our reality. We are actually aiming our final identity. What we really are. 2 Corinthians 3, 18 says, And we all with unveiled face, beholding, gazing, spending time, investing my time to behold the glory of the Lord. We are transformed into the same image. We get His character, His identity from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So when you and I are filled with the Spirit, we are being identified with the image of Christ. Or I can even quote another passage in 1 John chapter 4. The apostle said that because we are aware of the love of God, when we spend time in His love, being reminded of how He loved us, we head toward our likeness with Christ. 1 John 4, 17, by this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as He is, so also we in this world. We are in this world. So as I behold the glory, and as I am reminded of His love for me, I'm not running from reality. I'm running toward reality. I'm actually getting into this identification. So I can't insist more that you should never miss your life group in this next season. You should really put in your weekly schedule. You're not going to put anything else in your service morning. You're going to really make a priority. Not because you want to run from reality. Not just, just because you want to turn off and fantasize. No, no, no. On the contrary. You are actually heading. You are being transformed. You are being identified with what God called you to be. So don't miss the opportunity to speak to one another. To sing and make melody for the Lord with a grateful heart. So when we schedule the secret room, these worship moments together, I'm just giving you a pretext to get a little drunk every Friday night. And I know people craves for Fridays after work time. We too now. We do it because we're going to get together to worship Jesus. 
And I know on Wednesday when I meet my mega life group, I'm going to get a little bit more drunk. And also on Sunday morning when this worship team, come on, let's give it up for the worship team today once again. They really facilitate, they were really those that served us a good wine today. Amen. That's how it's supposed to be. Now, I want you to be reminded of this context of spirit feeling uh, principles. Because when we read verse 21, our guys with your Bibles open there in Ephesians. You can notice, at least in my paper version, that the paragraph where verse 21 is written is the same context is speaking of being spirit-filled. To be full of the Spirit. Which implies that once we decide to be servants, submitting to one another, we are also embracing the practice of being filled with the Spirit, as much as speaking to one another, singing and worshiping Jesus together. Maybe you never connected one thing to another, but for everyone that ever served in the service flow. How many of you guys ever served in the service flow? Let me see your hands. One hand high. You're going to testify with me. You're going to bear witness of what I'm going to say now. Even when you could not be here being served... But while you were serving out there, right, greeting people at the door, cleaning the chairs before, coming early, you know what happened to you. You left the service spirit-filled. And you were, didn't have the opportunity to necessarily worship and sing along with us here in the service. Because you were cleaning. You were running after the kids out there in the kids' service. You were doing something for the Lord. For the Lord. Out of reverence to the Lord. And... You didn't notice, but you were being filled with the Spirit. And it's interesting because I talked to those, those people after the service. And they, and they expressed to me sometimes, more blessed than my audience. Which makes me wonder if my preaching is actually worth it continue. Maybe I should be serving somewhere else. In other words, you should never also miss the chance of serving. Because this gives you a great opportunity to be Spirit-filled. Are you guys with me? Now... That's my subject because the principle of spirit-filled relationships will happen all the way in these uh, verses we're going to read from chapter 5 verse 22 until chapter 6 verse 9. So it's a long uh, aspect we're going to try to cover. Probably I won't be able to do it all today. But now we've got the basis of it. Let's read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. <laughs> and this is one of those verses that husbands know by heart. Some of them know this verse more than John 3.16. They know to quote this. They have no idea where this verse is, but they know it is in the Bible. Right? They are proud to say that verse. Okay. First, I need to say that you cannot read this verse without the context of it. And maybe you didn't know that, but the word to submit was not there in the original. This is part of the translation conclusion. In other words, you should read verse 21 and 22 in a sequence. Let's try to do this. Taking the word to submit out. Look how we're going to sound. Verse 21 again. Submitting to one another out of reverence of Christ, wives, to your own husbands, as to the Lord. So when I read in this way, it sounds that submitting is a, just a general principle. And the first application that Paul we're going to use is in the marital relationship. It's between spouses. He picked Ladies first, because ladies always comes first. There's no other reason. There's no necessarily saying, this is a must to be understood first. Because No, no. The whole idea until chapter 6 is submitting. Now, that's why the word submitting or to submit is so key for us to understand. The original here is hupotasso. Which is a combination of two words, hupo, that means to put under, and tasso, 
that means to rank, to arrange. I like to translate to submit like this, to put under order, to keep the order, to establish order for growth. So once again, there is no reason for us to move to chapter 6, the warfare of the believer, if we first don't have order in the house, order in the army. They're going to fight the spiritual warfare. We can move forward to chapter 6, the warfare of the believer, if first we are not spirit-filled. We're going to be crushed. We're going to feel the attacks. And also, the devil is going to try to make a mess. We need to be a strong, organized army. Come on, let's open your Bible in 1 Corinthians. Go back a little bit from Ephesians. You're going to find 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Our guys, there with me. Say amen. amen. Look what it says. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. Now, wait a minute, Pastor. We are Trinitarians. We believe that God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equal in essence and in nature. But now, the Bible is affirming that the head of Christ is God. Yes, as much as he's affirmed in John chapter 10 that the Father is greater. Not greater in essence, not greater in nature. Our God is one God in the three manifestations of the divinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, they are equal, but not in aspects of superiority, but in functionality. It is important that we understand the need of order. And I came from a country that the flag has a motto on it. You guys remember the Brazil's flag motto? Order and progress. But it should be read better. Order is progress. That is why in the Godhead, order is needed. In the family, order is is needed in parenting order is needed in the military layers of ranks of authority is needed as much as in the church so order produces progress produces expansion order gives stability so let's keep reading Ephesians Chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit your own husband as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Again, it's not about tyranny. It does not imply superiority of the male. It implies the functionality of the marriage. Now I have to say that toward husbands that tend to see their wives as inferior. And sometimes they even dare to tell me that their wives are dumb. So dumb that marry you, sir. So don't ever call your wife dumb. Someone told me the story of Adam talking to God, wondering, God, why did you make her so soft, so perfumed, so beautiful? So God replied, son, so you could love her. So then Adam said, but she seems so different and even foolish. Yes, I made her so she could love you, son. And that's the problem when we think in this uh, superiority layer perspective there is a goal for the role that's how I place here 
The word to submit is to submit as to the Lord. In other words, this call for the women is a call for an active expression of worship to God. Ultimately, your submission, our submission, is a submission to Jesus. Is a submission to His Lordship. Which I need to stop here and tell you, fathers, parents, but also mainly husbands. Don't expect submission, yielding from your spouse, from your children, if they are not spirit-filled. This will not happen. Look, you cannot take the text out of its context. Submission is a fruit of the Spirit. Now, this works in every layer of relationship. Trying to force your child to do something when your house is not filled with the Spirit is ineffective. They will not yield. Now, I don't know if they do it just because they are my kids. But I believe me and my wife, we are doing a pretty decent work with my boys. Like we, one thing we do, we really don't give them much an option to not be part of meetings of being filled with the Spirit. They go with us. You know, if they're going to get into the vibe or not, I don't know, but they're going to have the chance to. And usually they really do. They really get involved into it. And the consequence of that is that when I come Sunday morning now, both of them, I never force that to them. And they are not here, but I, they could witness what I'm saying. They come to my office. Usually I'm studying. Just make my final notes for my message. And both of them come to me and say, Dad, how can I help today? Is there anything I can do? And if you are ever leading one of the service flow, if you are one of the leaders, you'll probably notice them. Doing, I never asked them to do that. I never forced them to do that. Because it's just a simple Fruit is a simple reaction of people that are spirit-filled. So the other way around works too. Don't expect people to yield, to surrender if they are not touched by the Spirit. Compliance in the church or in the workplace functions better when people feel the Holy Spirit in the atmosphere, in the ambience. So submission is a direct action of the Spirit. Now, if I really understand that I'm doing for the Lord, women in the, room, in the room here, pay attention. First Peter chapter 3, verse 1, you don't need to open, says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct. If I really understand I'm serving God. And I'm giving this testimony of worship as I serve. When I clean the dishes. When I cook the meal. When I wipe that runny nose that never stops. Or clean that diapers again. As uh, doing for the Lord. And I keep doing this for the Lord. There is a great chance you're going to win. You're going to evangelize without any words. We win by example. Not by nagging. Not by pushing. Not by prodding. Not, not just putting another evangelistic track in his pocket. Now I agree there is some limits here. Because submit as to the Lord means... That you should not submit to anything that you know is not scriptural. Something that goes clearly against the Bible instructions. You don't necessarily need to submit. And I know it seems very broad when Paul says to submit to your husband in everything. <laughs> it, it seems so big. In everything? Yes. Yes. As we testify this love for the Lord. So submitting 
It must be something that all Christians can offer each other. Regardless of our social, familial, or economical status. If I'm in a community of mutual submission, I just don't wait for a brother or sister or a pastor. Give me directions. Rather, I humbly seek opportunities to serve. I understood Jesus' example and I have His love empowering me to also stoop to wash my brother's feet. Say amen, everybody. Now, again, your paper Bible will help you to see what I mean when I follow up with the next verses. We have three verses for the wives. And we have a paragraph of... I don't know how many verses for the husbands. It's because probably we are the guy, we are the people that have more hard time to understand. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Are you guys there with me? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. We create a bad habit here, right? You're very passive. Now we even turn it off. So follow me in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So that he might present the church to himself in his splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Say amen, everybody. Now, given to the Greek or Roman culture context, where the church of Ephesus was established, and the fact that Paul just said, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, we were expecting that Paul will start the next session saying, husbands, exercise control over your wives but he doesn't say that rather he says husbands love your wives <laughs> so there is no need to establish authority here actually the only moment Paul uses the word authority in the marital relationship has to do with the mutual authority. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 4. Now you guys can follow up. For the wife does not have, look the word, authority over her own body. So far, it seems very clear what Paul had written... In verse 22, wives, submit your own husbands as to the Lord. But for the surprise of the readers, and maybe for you 20,000 years later, we have to keep reading the text that says, do not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body body but the wife does only the women say amen. amen so you girls can count with his strength for whatever needs to be fixed in the house and you guys can count with the love and caring touch of your wife amen. whenever you need it amen. there is no again superiority is functionality it's what the Bible calls mutual authority. Now, the mutual authority sometimes gets stuck with decisions or preferences that needs to be made. That's why the roles were important. Because at the end, he needs to pay the bill. So somebody has to make the deciding vote. 
the driving direction. Now, as good leader, you don't want to impose your decision. So you don't use authority. You use leadership. What kind of leadership? Words. Only the men in the house say words. Words is the most effective tool for leadership. It's not force. It's not strength. It's not brutality. It's not violence. Only words. But what kind of words? Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 5 again. Verse 26. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. In other words, you're going to use words that will promote the uniqueness of your wife. Sanctify her means she is set apart. Pay attention, guys. You don't talk to your wife as you talk to your buddy. You don't direct to your wife as you talk to a friend. She may be your best friend, but she's more than that. So you choose wisely your words because your words have the power to sanctify her and bring the sense of uniqueness that eventually you gain credit. You achieve credit for the decision that needs to be made. But also, it is words that refreshes. That's why I put it like this. I'm actually subtitled this moment, words that refreshes. What type of word is that? It can't be the law. It can't be the demanding high commandments. It has to be the gospel. Whenever we talk, we talk the message of grace to one another. We remind one another of the finished work on the cross. We remind it of our justification, our righteousness in Christ, who we are in Christ Jesus. No, pastor, I tried that and we still we stuck in a decision. We have to make a decision if we're going to move or not. If we're going to buy that car or sell the car. And we are not binging, we're not surrendering, none of us. What can we do now? We do what the Bible asks you to do. You bring your marriage to the church. And I know from our Western individualistic background, we think that marriage is a private domain of husband and wife. If you are Brazilian, you understand that briga de marido e mulher, ninguém mete a colher. But this is fake and this is false. Like if you are married and you came to the church, your marriage belongs to the church as well. And maybe you never heard this, but without the church, you have a great risk to not survive marriage. Because it is hard already. But much more without the church. So in the impasse moment, you come to your leader. That eventually going to schedule with the pastor a moment of unlock, unstucking moment. Based on wisdom in the scripture. So that's where husbands and wives should be intentional to bring their marriages to the church. Let's be honest guys. It's for our own benefits. Look what the Bible says. Let's keep reading. Ephesians Chapter 5, verse 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. So he who loves, I'm sorry, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, but just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. Verse 31, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold, cling fast to his wife. 
and the two shall become one flesh. The mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ in the church. Verse 33. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husbands. So, let us not be cheap with our loving words, man. Remember when you conquer her? Probably wasn't because of your stylish hair. You had a cool hair, but it wasn't enough to conquer her. You, you probably use a lot of words. Words were important then. Words are essential now. So don't be stingy with your words. Use it a lot to conquer her heart, to win her heart over and over again. So the point here is how much a wife is willing to submit is directly related to how much she feels loved. Like it's clear connection. I don't know if it's your case. Maybe I'm in an extreme and I'm not aware of. But my wife chooses even what I dress. And I don't know if she does that because I know I represent her in the stage in a certain level. But also because I think she cares for me. Either way, I notice that she dresses me a lot in the proportion of how I treated her during the week. So I'm well dressed this weekend. <laughs> and because it's connected to one another. The caring, the submitting. The loving expression is directly related of how we treat one another. Now verse 31 brings this mind-blowing concept that people try to oversee. That our love have the power to witness. That our love in our marriage witnesses Christ. His endless, faithful, loyal love toward the church. Getting married is easy. Staying married is difficult. Staying happily married for a lifetime is among the finest of arts. But God, God is calling us to be an artist. God is calling us to be Picassos. That whenever people look to our marriages, they will see a clear display, a canvas of His love toward His people. And that's why divorce tarnishes so badly this witnessing of the church. And, and, and actually, it makes it difficult for the church to be relevant in the community. I think one of the best services we can give to our city is simply cherishing, taking care of our marriages and families. Somehow we represent God's family, His faithfulness, His loyalty toward us. The husband and wife are made of the same matter, the same stuff. When you try to separate these two elements, it would be impossible to not suffer some cracks and hurts. The old illustration said if you get two papers and glue them, and after 15 seconds try to separate them, you know they were not going to be the same paper. Why? Because it remains part of one another. And I'm not here to condemn anyone because maybe you had to go through divorce or separation. What we stand here in Vine Church is that we hate divorce and we love marriage. Simple like that. We don't hate divorce people. On the contrary, we love everyone. But we have to stand for the marriages. And I believe honestly that one of the reasons you chose this church is because of this stand. 
Even if you came from a past divorce situation, you don't want it to face it again. You know how hard it was, how painful it was. So you made the right choice being with us. Amen? We're going to take care of your, of your marriage. Now, let me close my message. I knew we were going to be able to cover the rest. But what I see here in this closing chapter is that God wants to express His unending love. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.25, let's go there with me. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. Let me invite you to stand up. John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world and He gave His Son. But if you was reading a different version of the same truth, if you're going to be reading this idea of love through the lenses of Jesus the Son, we will read Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26. God so loved the world that He gave His Son. But the Son gave Himself for the church. I know the love of God is for the world. Listen to me. But the love of Christ is only for the church. What do you mean, Pastor? It's because there is this layer of love. That is only perceivable for those that belongs to the church. And I'm not talking about the institution, the organization. We are better than that. We are an organism. We are a family. We are the bride. We are in a loving relationship. We are not in a legalistic religion. Come on somebody. And that's why whoever is here that is wondering about the love of God... You can look to Christ and be reminded that He loved the church to the point of giving Himself up for her. If this is one of the easy expressions of love a husband can say to his wife. I'm willing to die for you. But Jesus not only died for His church. He also is empowering His church. He's giving life for her. So we should never speak bad about the church. Because this is for what Christ died for. He loves the messy, the flawed, the broken church. And we are in the business of preparing this church for Him on that day. So rather than separating ourselves from the imperfect, wounded bride of Christ, we should join in Christ's work of washing, cleaning, feeding, caring for her. And maybe you are wondering if Vine Church, the church is for you. I want to make you an invitation for those that want to commit their marriage to the church. Their relationships to the church. Their personal lives to the church. Sounds weird maybe, but what I'm talking to you is that when you give your life to Christ, it is implied that you should give your life to the church as well. And we're not here in the business of manipulation. We have enough problems already. We're here in to facilitate to create moments like this so you can pray with your wife and through the prayer with your wife you can say words you can utter loving words that goes beyond a compliment that goes far above just a present you can buy her even though it's still necessary come on ladies buy her a dinner come on ladies it's still necessary but when you pray together 
when you bring your marriage, your family under this church love that Christ gave himself for, you receive, you perceive this love in your family, in your relationships. Let this, let do this together, everybody. Grab somebody, preferable your family, your wife, your spouse, your husband, maybe your children. Just find someone right now that you can pray with. Let's give our lives to Christ as we give ourselves back to the body, to the church. Father, I want to pray over every family in this place. Marriages, that needs the fire back, that needs the rekindle of passion, respect, love. I pray Holy Spirit for parents in this place that are struggling God to lead, influence their adults, child. They try convincing, they try evangelizing, but it's not working. Holy Spirit, I pray for a new, fresh anointing of your spirit, giving these parents right words that we will unlock the relationship in a new level, in a new dimension, God. I pray, Holy Spirit, for kids that are struggling inside of their homes with resentment, bitterness. It's hard to forgive. Father, release upon our church. Holy Spirit, come upon us with this fresh anointing of forgiveness of patience let the wives learn how to submit let the husbands learn how to love let the kids practice obedience let us to each other submit out of reverence of Christ